Welcome students to the lecture on the Renaissance. We're going to learn today about a time period directly following the Middle Ages, that time period you just learned about with feudalism in Europe, where Europe experienced something called a Renaissance. So this time period, just for you to have context, you're talking about 1450s to about 1600 is when we define as the Renaissance. And the Renaissance was a rebirth. Renaissance means rebirth or a bringing back of things that had been missed. So as you can see here, we have the definition of Renaissance or the actually the direct translation of the word, which means rebirth. It was a rebirth of art and learning, but I want you to know what art and learning they're referring to. During the Middle Ages, the feudalism time period, a lot of things had been lost or people in Europe didn't have access to it. And what I mean by that is the learning of the Greeks and the Romans. Um, we learned about this with the ancient civilizations and how they knew about um, irrigation and they knew about agricultural and building techniques um, that during the Middle Ages they had lost. In fact, the chemical way of making cement was something that the um, ancient Europeans knew, so the Romans knew it, but during the Middle Ages they had lost the formula. So a rebirth or a renaissance is a bringing back and a finding of these things where you had people that actually were interested in this time period prior um, to the Middle Ages and they went and they actually tried to find some of the information that had been lost and if that meant traveling they would travel to find these things a lot of the stuff had been um, held on to by like the Ottoman Empire because they really valued those things and you're gonna see a rebirth of these items it's gonna begin in northern Italy and a lot of people think that it began there because of the economic strength and the trade network around Italy that allowed for information to come in and out that hadn't previously been there so when we talk about how the Renaissance or rebirth was able to occur, a lot of people point to the economic changes that had happened in the 1400s. First of all, you have um, the plague that was referenced in a previous lecture, which had caused a lot of damage to the Europeans. And so a lot of people had died, but the ones that remained actually had a better economic opportunity because they had fewer people to compete with. And as a result, there actually was more wealth that was coming into Europe. At the same time that this is happening, in the, you're going to see the Europeans go out and conquer places in the New World like North and South America. And that money that comes from there is going to come back to Europe. And then the Europeans, as they get more wealthy, are going to start to demand to buy more exotic products. And a lot of that requires them to go over to the Middle East. And when they go over to the Middle East and they start to interact with them more, they, they start to see the things that they had lost, some of the learning and the knowledge that they had lost um, during the Middle Ages. And they bring it back to Europe. So there's an increased demand for Middle Eastern products during this time period. There's also one of the things that helps with an economy and helps for you if you're going to start paying for paintings or you're going to start exploring is the use of banking and credit. So there was um, banks that were developed and credit opportunities where people could get loans and invest. And that, again, is going to help with the renaissance of in Europe. So trade is going to speed up. There is going to be new accounting techniques and bookkeeping practices that come into the European area. And that has a lot to do with the principles that they found in um, the Ottoman Empire using Arabic numerals, which they hadn't used before. So that's going to transition over into Europe. And so Europe is going to start to expand economically. And that's going to be the foundation for this Renaissance. So where did the Renaissance begin? Well, it began in Italian city-states. So these were actually places that were still pretty feudal-like. So they had, Italy was not a unified country unlike places like um, France and England. And so there was still a lot of fighting between these different areas, but they were well known as trade um, hubs because it was right in the middle of the Mediterranean, as you can see here. And over to the east here, you have the Ottoman Empire. And to the west, you have some of the um, populations like France and England. And so Italy was a great stopping off point. And Florence, Venice, and Genoa 
were some of the major areas for trade. And you learned about the Venetians already and their trade with the Ottomans. So these trading centers where, where new ideas came in as well as new goods. And it just, again, when we talk about Renaissance, we talk about rebirth. It's like the economy was better, education was improving, people were able to read more, um, more things to read because more things were translated into people's everyday language. So there's just a lot of um, positive things going on. You have independent city states that are going to be governed as republics where they have some kind of representation, which is kind of harkens back to um, the ancient Greeks when they had um, democratic systems or even Rome where it had a republic situation going on. So, and you had wealthy merchants that were kind of in charge of these republics. So just a few ideas about how with this renaissance or rebirth, people started, one of the things they started to do was they started to do what had been done in ancient times. So in ancient times where it's like Rome and Greece, you had great thinkers who didn't have any problem questioning accepted ideas. A lot of times your teachers will say, hey, we're going to have a Socratic seminar, and that means that we're all going to discuss. Well, what does that term Socratic come from? It comes from this guy named Socrates. So he was an ancient philosopher who thought that things needed to be talked out. Well, during the Middle Ages, this idea of talking things out was, you really didn't have a lot of time to do it. The education was not there. The resources were not there. And in addition, the Catholic Church kind of controlled all knowledge. So when the Renaissance starts to happen, you start to see thinkers question authority. And one of those that was best known for questioning authority was named Niccolo Machiavelli. And he wrote the, uh, it was kind of a pamphlet or a very short book. It was uh, less than 100 pages called The Prince. And in this book, he was trying to give advice on how to properly govern uh, an area. So instead of just accepting that your leader is there because God put them there, he started to think about what would make a good leader and how you could become a good leader. And he became really the first political scientist. And he believed that sometimes you had to be ruthless and you had to like maybe be morally corrupt in order to accomplish what was best for your country. So if that meant you had to kill somebody um, or do something that might be considered to be not godlike or not very Christian, he said that that was okay if you had a good goal in mind. So again, maybe you needed to slaughter some people so that to take care of some other people. And he, he says a good leader would have to make those decisions. And you can't always just worry about whether or not you're doing what the Pope or the Catholic Church or what God was telling you to do. So he said one should do good if possible, but do evil when necessary. So he was one of these thinkers. He had his book. It, the book got banned by the Catholic Church. But just in general, his ideas spread, and he's a great example of a Renaissance thinker. Additionally, and probably best known, is the big changes in art. But we also want to mention there were changes in literature, and a Renaissance playwright would be someone like Shakespeare, coming out with his ideas. And so if you've ever seen Shakespeare, he's kind of, some of his uh, plays are not very... Uh, what's the word I want to use, appropriate. At the time, they were considered a little coarse. Uh, people said things that were a little off color. So if you've read any um, Shakespeare and your teacher kind of pointed out what some of those phrases really meant, you might have covered your mouth and been like, oh my gosh, that's inappropriate. So literature changed a lot during this time period. It became more accessible. So not only did it kind of deal with issues, everyday life and things that people... Um, prior to this, you only read about God. Um, but the other thing that literature did is it focused on people. Um, we call this secular because if it's focused on the humans, then it's not focused on God. So there's two words that you might want to learn here. Secular means focused on people in every day. And what we call ecclesiastical focuses on God. So Art and literature became more secular. It doesn't mean it didn't have religion. It just meant that the focus oftentimes, even in the religious paintings, was what people were doing. So it says here medieval art and literature had focused on the church and salvation. But Renaissance, Renaissance art is going to focus on 
individuals, worldly matters, along with Christianity. So again, even the Christian paintings were meant to show us a little bit more about humans and themselves and less a focus on just the story of Christ. So you're going to see that kind of change. And again, you're going to see a little bit of people moving away from religion. So in order to understand the difference in art, you kind of need to know what art was like before. So on the right here, I have a Byzantine um, chapel where you can see what we would call Gothic art, which is right before Renaissance art, what it looked like. And you have to just understand that it was the purpose was religious. So again, it was to teach you religious principles. It was educational. It was to make you so you behaved in a right manner and you behaved like a good Christian. It usually was one dimensional or flat. You see very little perspective or depth over here in this painting. You're not going to really see any shadowing because that's a technique that comes out of the Renaissance. You see a little bit of it here on the robes where it looks like there's some depth to the robes. Again, given that this was Gothic art, it's transitioning into Renaissance art, so you're starting to see it, but you'll really see a big difference in Renaissance art. Most of the people would be front facing because again, it would be a little more challenging to paint side views. Now again, if you think about the Renaissance as a rebirth, you go back to sculptures and art from ancient Rome and it was had even more depth and stuff than than the art in the Middle Ages. So again it was a rebirth even of techniques from um, a thousand years before. So there's very little realism, no attempt to make it look like how people actually look. In fact a lot of times it was the same face over and over again um, just maybe with different color hair or different robes or something like that. Um, it was unsigned. So this was very important because during the Renaissance you're going to see people start to take credit for what they do. It's a focus on humans. So they want to kind of be like the rock stars. This is my art. I'm going to sign it. But during this time period, during the Middle Ages, art was not signed because it was meant to give glory to God. So it kind of followed a formula. Church so as the Middle Ages art was very formulaic and very religious in nature and you didn't see much depth or and everybody was mostly front facing, you're going to see the father of Renaissance art, his name was Giotto, and he's going to be kind of the first artist to start to practice some of the techniques that will become very um, well done by people like Michelangelo and Leonardo da Vinci and Raphael. Um, and, and Botticelli and stuff like that in during the Renaissance. He's the first to try some of these Renaissance techniques. And so it's very, it's in the elementary stage, but you can start to see in this painting some depth. You start to see um, an attempt at a linear perspective as it goes back here. You also start to see the attempt, if you were to look at this in detail, you'd see a lot of the shading with the robes to show depth as well as her um, white tunic here. This is um, the mother of Jesus, Madonna. And then you see Jesus here. And notice that you don't yet see kind of that natural quality of it looking like a baby and understanding proportion because it looks like just a shrunk, shrunk down old man. And we're going to talk a little bit about why a lot of baby Jesuses look like shrunk down old men when you see this video. So I want to show you this bit video about middle-aged babies, middle ages babies, and specifically baby Jesus. And then we'll talk a little bit more about how the Renaissance changed art after that. Going in the museum and it's great. The guards check your bag to make sure you won't, I don't know, shoot a painting. Uh, you go up some fancy escalators, you see naked statues, and then it happens. You see a super ugly medieval baby. Why do medieval babies look like ugly middle-aged men? I mean, this baby looks like he wants to tell you that a boat is just a money pit. It might seem like medieval artists were just bad at drawing, but it turns out that babies in medieval art are actually ugly for a reason. While there were breakthroughs in anatomy and perspective that happened later in the Renaissance, Ugly medieval babies were an intentional choice before that time. If somebody told you to paint like Pablo Picasso and you gave them Norman Rockwell, you'd have screwed up. And it was the same way for medieval artists working in churches in Italy. 
because most of these babies were depictions of Jesus and Mary. They were influenced by the idea of the homunculus, which is Latin for little man. These babies looked like Benjamin Button because philosophers believed Jesus was born perfectly formed and unchanged. The adult Jesus was represented in the baby Jesus until the Renaissance when everything changed. Generally, we think of the Middle Ages as lasting from around the 5th to the 15th century, and it kind of overlapped the beginning of the Renaissance in the 14th century. Renaissance probably began in Florence, Italy, but it's important to note that it unfolded over centuries and countries in a time when everything moved slowly, so it wasn't instant beautiful babies everywhere. Still, the change in style did happen, and it happened for a couple of reasons. Suddenly, places like Florence were getting richer, and churches weren't the only places that could afford paintings. People could get their own babies painted, and they wanted them to look like cute, chubby babies, not homunculi. And because the Renaissance was all about classics, they looked at Greek and Roman art, which was all about idealized forms that ditched the medieval abstraction for beauty and... Okay, who put that ugly baby there? Anyway, the point is that after the Renaissance, cherubs didn't seem out of place, and neither did cuter pictures of baby Jesus as the Renaissance spread through Europe. And it's kind of stayed that way since. We want babies who look like they need their cheeks pinched, not their prostates checked. We want them chubby and cute, and we want babies that fit our ideals. Because those medieval babies, they have a face that only a mother could love. So as we move away from the Middle Ages, you're going to start to see art during the Renaissance and the early in Renaissance mainly that embraces natural, the natural world, the human emotions. They really like mathematical order and symmetry. You're going to see um, the attempt at making things proportional. You're also going to see shading that increases depth. In addition, you're going to see um, linear perspective. So you're going to be able to see that mathematical geometric line going through the painting, even though it's not obvious, but you can figure out where that line is and where the depth is created because of that perspective. Um, later in the late Renaissance, there's going to be a time period called mannerism, which is going to get rid of all of this and try to do things off, um, lacking proportion, not symmetrical, strange, maybe a little abnormal. So again, the Renaissance brings in these new techniques and then once they feel like they really understand these techniques, they're going to then try to mess with them, and that's called mannerism. But for the most part, when you see paintings or sculptures during the Renaissance, they are going to attempt to look like this. This is Michelangelo's David on the left. I'm trying to, this is Bernini's statue. I'm trying to remember. It's something about Zeus. Um, but again, notice the attempt at making sure that everything is proportional, that um, the actual human musculature is clearly developed. There is a focus on making it look like people really look. However, it might be a little idealized, right? There's also an attempt, this is this idea that you can do these free standing statues here was something, a skill that had been lost um, and then the Renaissance brought this back. These are both in Florence, these two. This is also in Florence, architecture. They brought back the ability to create these domes. Uh, this is the largest freestanding dome in Europe, and it's called Brunelleschi's Dome. And it's just amazing that they were able to do it during Renaissance time without actually having a, a lot of the tools we have today. You can go online and look at a video that tells you how they did it. And then you have Again, some of the artwork, these are baptistry doors. These are doors that you would go into get baptized that actually had something called a baptistry during this time period because you couldn't go into the church, the actual cathedral, until you were baptized. So it was a separate building to be baptized. And what's important about this is they had a competition, very Renaissance-like. They had a competition to see who could create um, the best doors for the baptistry. And then the person who won got to do it, and his name was Giberte. And he actually put his, you know how I told you in the Middle Ages, they didn't even sign their artwork. He put his face, he like selfie bombed this thing. He put his face on the doorknobs. So his little bald head is what you would pull um, along with another handle to be able to open this door. So he obviously was very proud of his work and the fact that he won. And so he put himself on his, his doors that he created. So let's move on to a couple of writers. 
or at least one writer. We already talked about Machiavelli. I wanted to mention Petrarch also. Petrarch is also considered to be the father of humanism. Humanism is a, the study of man and his nature, and he is known for writing sonnets. Um, sonnets were like poems. Some, a lot of times you'll see uh, Shakespeare had sonnets. I remember I had to memorize a sonnet when I was in high school. Honestly, I don't remember it anymore. But um, it was just a way to focus on man and man's emotions and man's nature. So he was considered, Petrarch was considered the father of humanism. To just go into a little bit of humanism, which is a big idea in the Renaissance, um, humanism celebrated the individual. It's, um, it was the result of the study of Greek and Roman literature and culture. And a lot of times people who called themselves humanists were patrons, uh, were um, supported by patrons who were very wealthy. So, for instance, um, da Vinci was, a lot of his work was paid for by this guy named Medici, who was a wealthy um, ruler in Florence. You also had Michelangelo, who was supported by the same Medici. Um, again, so you had humanists who did their study of humans and humanities, and their, they had to, the only way they could do it is if they were paid, and they were paid by wealthy merchant families usually. So that's humanism. Just to give you a couple of, um, a little bit of information. So it started out in Italy, but it's eventually, the Renaissance is going to move throughout Europe, and it's going to spread um, north. And as it spreads north, the Renaissance will adapt and change to the different cultural values of the area. And the general statement that you can make is the Northern Renaissance was more religious. It had less focus on like Greek and Roman mythology. And if you, that makes sense because it's farther away from Greece and Rome. So they put more of their, the things that were important to them into the Renaissance ideals. The Northern Renaissance, some of the um, well-known people in it were writers, and one of them was Erasmus, and he started to criticize the Catholic Church. So again, the church was really important to them, but again, a Renaissance person would start to think about uh, what had been in the past, think about history, think about what's best, and actually use their minds to make changes. So some of the things that they're going to do are help, going to help to start the Protestant Reformation, which is where the Catholic Church splits as a result of some protests. That's where you get the term Protestant. And then another northern writer that was really important is his name was Sir Thomas More, and he wrote this um, book called Utopia, where he talked about, again, a perfect society. And, but he was a religious person, so whereas Machiavelli wrote about how you could have a good government, sometimes you have to do bad things, Sir Thomas More talked about a good leader was a very ethical and religious leader who followed Christian doctrine. So he had a different belief. He actually is from England. He lived in England. And Henry VIII, who had all those wives that he, some of them he killed, and who would separate from the Catholic Church, ended up executing his dear friend, Sir Thomas More because he didn't like how, what Sir Thomas More said about his divorce of his wife, because he didn't think that that was ethical. But he depicts the world with perfect social, legal, and political system, and he was a leading scholar during humanist scholar. So these are some of the main things that you need to know about the Renaissance. I would recap it by saying that the Renaissance was a rebirth of classical ideas from Greek, Greece and Rome, they were able to get these ideas because um, in Italy it was connect connected through trade to the Ottoman Empire and some of the areas that had held on to the learning and the teaching that had been lost during the Middle Ages and then was rediscovered. And that's why they were able to have a renaissance with a rebirth because these ideas were rediscovered. And then they were able to focus and have people start to study and write and paint because of the economic strength of Europe after the um, plague and because of all the trade and because of the conquering of the new world, you had more money coming into Europe. And as a result, you had wealthy patrons who were paying these people 
to write, these humanists, to write and to paint and to think differently and to do research. So the Renaissance, again, means rebirth, and it lasted until about the 1600s. So you're going to want to finish up your notes page, make sure that you write a complete summary, and then you will turn that into turnitin.com. Thank you.